Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fill not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Martin, in the short six weeks that I've been here, I've come to know you as a dear brother in the Lord. And uh, as my time is starting here, your time is taking a new direction. And while we've celebrated Give This Christmas Away, we celebrate God's faithfulness here at this church at Northwest Chapel. God's faithfulness shines through and he has shined in and through you all of these years. And today, we wanted to pause and thank you, you and Christy, right, for your time here and to recognize God's faithfulness in and through you. And we celebrate that. Martin, if it's possible to share back over all these years of ministry, what are some thoughts that you have as, as you look back on those years and, and how God's faithfulness really has been represented here? Uh, well, thank you, Marty. I've also come to appreciate you, and I, I, I like you. And, and as a brother in Christ, I, I feel like our journey is just beginning as friends and brothers. Um, but a couple of things, I, when, I, when I look across the years and, and uh, think about God's faithfulness is, you know, when I first came to Northwood Chapel, I was not married. I was single. I was in seminary, and I was... Uh, my last year, I did an internship here at Northwest Chapel, and it was the second year of Northwest Chapel's existence. And we were still meeting in the basement of a bank building. Some of you came to me and we might remember that time, so that was a long time ago. Um, but in 87, one year later, I got married to my beloved bride, Christy, and a few years later, we had Danny, our, our son. And, uh, and then a few years later, my mom and dad joined us and so really it's it was a time of family for me and 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 you know it's about the journey right it's about those who go with you and so I I, I would be amiss if I didn't thank God for that so you know thank you Christy thank you Danny thank you dad and thank you mom up there you know watching down at this moment because that has made it worthwhile for me you know but there is another family that I must mention, and that is the Northwood Chapel family. I think when I came, as every young man, you know, you have many, many visions of doing great things for the Lord. Uh, what I've learned, though, is not about the great things you accomplish, but about the people that travel the road with you. And, and uh, you know, there are those that are not here today that have traveled the world, the, the, this journey with me and with us. 
here at Northwest Chapel that are now up with my mom in heaven and join uh, a time over there with Jesus. And we're on our way there, right? All of us are going to that place. But, uh, but I'm thankful for Northwest Chapel because we've spent years together, you know, crying together, sharing together, serving together in adventures and missions trips. And, and uh, GTCA is just one of my favorite days. I'm so glad to have this moment on this day of all days because this is the day when the family shows up. You know, the family becomes the team. And, and we, those of us who, who get to train and coach and you know, we, we love to stand on the, saddle, on the sidelines and watch God do the work that he's doing through you in our community and around the world. So uh, those are a couple of things, yeah. Well, and, and obviously, oh, there, wait, there, before I say, I mean, oh, I, wanted to, I wanted to end this part of it by, by, by saying thank you. Thank you, Northwood Chapel. Thank you for the journey that you've been on with me and with us, with my family and I together. Um, I couldn't have done it, wouldn't want to do it without you. And as we go into the next phase, uh, one of somebody said, Martin, you may be leaving us the chapel, but we're going with you. Uh, don't forget that. And so I won't ever forget that. Yeah, no, I, you know, Martin, I, obviously there's so much and I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to kind of filter out and just share a few moments. But, you know, over the years, right, God takes us in through some wonderfully joyful times, but also some some tough times, some struggles, and and we can ask ourselves, people might even ask us the same question, you know, is, is, is it all worth it, all of that, all of that, but you've recently shared with me kind of a, a new take, a new perspective on how to approach that thought. So, so recently I heard of a missionary who's now passed away, but she was a missionary doctor in Africa, and she suffered tremendously, you know, during her time there, and and uh, they were interviewing her, and they were asking her, was it worth all the, all the suffering? And she looked at the person, and, and, and I, I thought, this is what it is. And she said, you know, you can ask the question, was it worth it? But the real question that God has taught me to ask is not really, is it worth it? But rather, is he worthy? And, you know, when you ask that question, the answer is always, he, he is worthy, right? And so as we look at the reflection of, of his worthiness in the song great is thy faithfulness we see that the worthiness of god is what makes life worthwhile it's not us it's never about us it's always about him and so when i when i think of that that's what i want to keep my focus on is his worthiness and i look at the next verse that we're going to sing here in a minute and I think that's about it. It's about, it's about summed it up, right? It's the gospel. It's his love. It says, pardon for sin and the peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide both yesterday, today, and in the days to come. Now, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. What is the bright hope for tomorrow? That is, no matter what the change is in the faces here on the platform, it's still of God's faithfulness that started this, God's faithfulness that will carry it to completion. So we thank him for that, and I think you all will join me in saying that. Blessings all mine, and I would say ours, belong to us, right? With 10,000 beside that continue to await us until we meet Jesus and all the other saints that have gone before us in heaven. And so today we celebrate, Martin, and, and we, and Christy. This is a good man, and God has used him in, in tremendous ways here. Um, and, and with that... We, we wanted to share that with all of you. So after the service, there's some cupcakes in the comments. So don't, don't forget about that. And certainly take time to visit with Martin and Christy there too. Uh, but as we, as we kind of close out this time, and I'm going to have Lynn come up in a minute, you're not done yet. God's got big plans for you. So even though you are moving on and our hearts go with you, what's next for you and Christy? Well, back in 1988, we went to, my wife and I, we were married in 87. In 88, we went to language school. 89, we went to Mexico. And the idea was to start a church down in Mexico City. And, uh, and as we were doing that, God shifted our focus to, to think more about training the next generation, about training leaders. And we started an organization that trained leaders. And that's still going on today. And so essentially what God is calling us to do is to join that movement of training the next generation. And, I, and I'm so uh, honored to, to, be, to be able to say 
you know, I'm getting to that age where we need to hand the keys over to the next generation and said, you drive this car. And so as, as we look, as I look forward to that time, it's about supporting, it's about encouraging, it's about uh, resourcing that next generation and the team that is already down there doing that work in Mexico and other places in the Caribbean that uh, are part of the team right now to continue that process that they've already begun and God is already doing. So I'm just joining something that God is doing and it's fun to see, to just be a part of that. So, Well, thank you so much, Martin, and, and really and truly. Lynn, come on up. And um, Lynn's going to lead out in prayer as a way for, for Northwest Chapel to kind of send uh, Martin and Christy off with a blessing, with, with love, and and with the joy that, that we'll see you on a regular basis. You, you aren't moving out of the country. You're, you'll be in Marysville, and you'll be yes. back to visit and share as we continue to see what God does in and through you. But as a way to, to just thank you and to, and to bless you, Lynn's going to pray. And, and would you join him as he leads us in prayer? Hmm. Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for the opportunity that you have given us throughout the years and each and every day to serve others. Lord, we thank you for Martin's leadership and Christy, and we also thank you for this transition into, into um, another pastor, Marty, that can be our leader and, and, and guide us and, and share with us um, our abilities to serve, recognize the needs out there, help us to soften our hearts and toughen our hands open our eyes and ears to serve others as Martin and Christy have done and as Marty will do. Lord, be with Northwest Chapel as we move forward as it's not mission trips, it's we are missionaries each and every day, Lord, to serve you, to share the gospel with others. Help us open our eyes and ears and serve. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Before, you, before you do that, I just wanted to say that it was a huge challenge that we had in the transition to find another person with my same name to be able to hand it to. <laughs> so, but we found him. We found him. So, you know, just, you know, because we planned a service before he came along. We know it was going to be from Martin to Martin. So thank you for filling in that spot. So yes, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Sorry. Hey, let me invite you to stand and, and sing verse three with us. Pardon for sin and the peace that endureth. I own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for two. so much for singing with us. We invite you to take a seat, and I'm going to pray. Father, it's been so good to be in your presence this morning, to sing your praise, 
to look at the birth of your son and to focus on you coming out of busy lives and busy weeks. Thank you so much for the time we had to celebrate GTCA and all that you enabled us to do through that. It is by your power and yours alone that we accomplish these things. Thank you so much for, for Marty and Martin and this time to celebrate Martin and all that he's done, all that you've done through him. Bless he and his family as he moves on to this next chapter. And Lord, now would you open our ears to hear and our eyes to see what you would say through your word. Speak through your word as only you can. It's in your son's most precious name that we pray. Amen. As we start thinking about hope together, why don't you take a moment and share with someone sitting around you, what are you hoping for this Christmas season? Go ahead and share with someone sitting around you. What are you hoping for this Christmas season? I think that if you ask a group of people what it is they're hopeful for, what it is they're celebrating at Christmas, that uh, can we bring that down? Thank you very much. That uh, most answers won't have anything to do with Jesus. I imagine you'd hear answers like, well, I'm celebrating I made it through another year. I got a Christmas bonus. I'm celebrating that I'm home with family or that I've finished all my shopping with two and a half hours to spare. Some would say, I'm not celebrating anything, I'm just trying to survive. If you can relate to any of those, and I think we all have at one time or another, I would suggest that those are people, we are people who need to be reminded of the hope that we have because Christ has come. Emmanuel, God with us. Merry Christmas, Chapel family. We're using Romans chapter 5, verse 13 as our impetus for this series. Would you read it with me from the screen? Here we go. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't that be great to overflow with hope? Just when you hear that, do you think of people who live that way? That they have such strong hope in what God is doing, what Jesus has done in their lives, that it kind of spills over to everyone they rub shoulders with? I love being around people like that. And I think it would be the greatest blessing to be a person like that to someone else in my church family or my neighborhood or my blood family. So let's begin by considering a definition of biblical hope because it's different than what the world has in mind when they talk about hope. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5 and look at verse 1. If you're using a Bible from the rack in front of you, you'll find that on page 1039. There's so much in this passage, but I think we find, amongst other things, something that helps us towards a biblical definition of hope. Here's what it says, Romans chapter 5, since we have been declared righteous by faith, not righteous by our own deeds, but righteous by faith in Jesus, that's the concept of justification, we have peace with God. We talked about that last week through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Are you hoping in the glory of God? Do you rejoice in the hope of the glory of God? Might that hope disappoint? 
absolutely not. Because God alone is worthy of all honor and glory and power and praise. His, his creation testifies. It screams His worthiness and His greatness. And then when you hear the stories that we've heard this morning and see the lives of people who have been brought from death to spiritual life. It magnifies God's glory. And when you enter into the most majestic Christmas celebration or the most moving music celebration, they're often directed towards the glory of God and it will not disappoint. Look at verse 5. This hope will not disappoint because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, there's common hope that the world knows all about. Just watch some of those uh, Hallmark Christmas movies, right? I mean, those are some of the sweetest, sappiest, nicest people you will ever see on your TV screen. And it just they're just so positive and so kind, and it all works out, and they all live happily ever after. That kind of hope leaves people disillusioned, devastated, wondering... How come my life isn't like the Hallmark Christmas movies? Because there's common hope and then there's a supernatural living hope that this is talking about based on the rock solid truth of who God is and what he's done in sending Christ to earth. Merry Christmas, church family. The common hope is kind of uh, nebulous and it often doesn't materialize. You know, I hope it's warm all winter in central Ohio. Good luck with that. Or I hope my team never loses. Or I hope my kids come out perfect. Or I hope to get an education so I can get a job, so I can get income, so I can get a spouse, so I can get children. All of that will make me happy. Look, those things offer a measure of happiness, but biblical hope is different because it's founded upon who God is and He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe that, church? That's why this hope will not disappoint. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts. That's Emmanuel. That's the incarnation. That's the precious baby in the manger who didn't stay in the manger, but went to the cross on our behalf. Hey, if you're hoping in our economy for happiness, you may be in for some hard times, if you're trusting in our government, if you're looking to people or to your work to satisfy you and and give you eternal well-being, most of that's going to fail because God created you with a purpose to be in relationship with him and only this hope based on Christ can provide for that. You see, it's different than our English word hope, which is just kind of Well, maybe it will, maybe it won't, but I can at least be positive. No, the word here in the New Testament contains no uncertainty. It speaks of something that is certain while not yet realized. Another way that someone has put it is it's already, but not yet. Certain, but not realized. Still future, so we're not seeing it happen. For instance... The promise of a Messiah who would come and rescue us from the curse of sin was given way back in Genesis 2. But generation after generation after generation lived and died waiting for some Savior to come. And then the Jewish nation was born and raised up. And they received the promise that a Messiah would come through their people. And yet uh, hundreds of thousands of them lived and died, not seeing Messiah, but they waited in hope, trusting that God would be faithful to his promise. Think about it. Then 2,000 years ago, Jesus comes as that baby. Messiah is born, but the vast majority of people alive at that point in time never heard him teach the Sermon on the Mount, never saw him perform a miracle, never saw him enter into the temple or waved palm branches at the triumphal entry. Most of them never even heard of Jesus. And so while the Messiah had come 2,000 years ago, redemption still had not been purchased. The Son of God had still not paid my sin penalty. So they were still waiting with tension, waiting for that hope to be fulfilled. 
Now here we are on the other side of the cross. We understand, we've heard again and again what Jesus came to earth to do. We're waiting for him to come again. And while we wait, there's tension. There's, we're anxious for him to come, and it gets a little sticky at times. We're waiting for him to come and establish his kingdom here on earth like it is in heaven. We're waiting for his glory to be revealed so that no one can miss it, so that no one can argue against it. But at this moment, it's still future, only perceived through eyes of faith. But this is far more than positive thinking, this biblical hope. If you put your faith wholeheartedly in Christ this Christmas season, he promises he will never let you go. So, when you're on the verge of relapse, like some of the people we saw in the video testimonies today, when the relationship is too painful, when the job seems like a dead end, when you cannot even see light at the end of the tunnel, this is a hope based on God's love through Jesus Christ that will sustain through all of that and whatever you're experiencing. That's biblical hope. And the key thing about this type of faith is where we place it. Consider the object of our hope as is revealed in this testimony. I was born in this city, the city of Buenos Aires. Pero mi vida no fue fácil. But my life was not easy. Había un grupo de jóvenes. There was a group of, of young people. Y yo empecé a estar con ellos. And I started just hanging y with them. Y empecé a, a estar, a hacer lo que ellos hacían and, también. And I would do what they would do. Ahí empecé a consumir drogas. So that's when I started trying different drugs. Al principio son gratis. First, you know, they're free. Después tienen que pagar. But then you had to pay. Estaba esclavo. I was a slave. Eh, no tenía dinero para comprarla. I didn't have money to buy more drugs. Entonces empecé a robar. So I started stealing. Eh, y hasta que caí preso. And I was taken to prison. Salía de estar preso. But I would get out. Eh, puedo hacer lo que quiera de mi vida. I can still do whatever I want eh, from no my life. No pasa nada. It's all okay. Pensaba que me podía llevar el mundo por delante. I thought I could live life and do whatever I wanted to do. Empecé a tomar cocaína. I started having cocaine. El primero tomaba por la nariz. First through my nose. Eh, pero después empecé a poner el brazo. But then I started putting it in my in my eh, arm. No sabía para dónde ir. I didn't know where to go. Estaba eh, perdido. I was completely lost. Pero un día pasó algo con mi vida. But one day something happened with y my por life. Eso estoy acá. And that's why I'm here. Un día encontré la verdadera libertad. One day I found true freedom. Y ese día, that day, yo estaba tirado en una I esquina. I was just on the floor in the street corner. En Buenos Aires. In Buenos Aires. Eh, y un in a man that was 80 years old. Eh, pasó por ahí. He was walking by. Pero este hombre me dijo cosas que yo nunca había escuchado. But this man told me things that I had never heard before. Me dijo, Fernando, he said, Fernando, eh, vos tenés un problema que es mucho más grande que la droga. You have a problem that is worse than drugs. En que, y que el SIDA. And that even AIDS. Eh, me dijo que mi problema se llamaba pecado. He said your problem is called y que sin. mis pecados me separaban de Dios. And your sin is separating you from Pero, God. Y que no había nada que podía quitar mi pecado. And nothing can take away that. Que solo una persona. But only one person. Y ese era Jesucristo. And that is Jesus Christ. Yo ese día that day, comprendí ese amor. I understood that love. Y ese día yo creí. And I, I believed that day. Eh, porque no había nada que me podía sacar. Nothing else could make me Pero free. Él me hizo libre. But Jesus made me free. Eh, Jesucristo me perdonó. Jesus Christ forgave me. Eh, hace ya más de 25 años que no consumo drogas. For 25 years I have not tested drugs again. Eh, pero Dios es bueno. God is good. Y hizo cosas muy lindas. And he did beautiful things. I wonder if Fernando's parents lost hope. I guess it depends on the object of their hope, where they were putting their faith. Uh, Rehab programs do everything they can, but so many people lapse back into drugs. If their hope was in the intestinal fortitude of their son, well, we see where that ended up. If they were counting on the goodness of general humanity in Buenos Aires to save their son, It wasn't going to happen. But this hope, Romans chapter 5, verse 5, will not disappoint because God has poured out his love in our hearts. Jesus came to earth and didn't stay as a baby in the manger. Merry Christmas, he went to the cross 
and died to pay my sin penalty and yours. And so it's never a question of being good enough to earn our way in. It's a question of will we believe and by faith follow Christ as Lord and Savior. My hope is not in my goodness as a pastor or as a husband or as a neighbor or as a son or as a brother or as a... My hope is in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen? Amen. Let's consider uh, just very briefly some of the other promises on which we hope. We have the solid hope of salvation. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's awesome. Now, most people believe that there's a God. Many people around us believe in Jesus. The Bible says that even the devil believes in Jesus, but we know he's not saved. It's this phrase about following Jesus as Lord that must be the distinction. Those of us who've received his salvation want to honor him, want to please him with every area of our lives. Secondly, we have a solid hope that others will be saved. No, even the most reprobate heart is not beyond the reach of God's amazing grace. Do I hear an amen? Because that's me. That's you. I mean, even the the great heroes of the faith in Scripture say... uh, You know, we were hopeless apart from God's grace that he's made evident through Christ. I love 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 that says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And so this Christmas season is a great time to share the hope of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, with people all around us. Thirdly, we have a solid hope that Jesus will return. Jesus himself said, if I go away, I'll come back and take you to be where I am. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 says, we are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Does that get your spiritual juices flowing? I mean, if you think about that and it doesn't make the little hairs on the back of your neck stand up, you better think again. Because this is our rock-solid hope. And then, when we see Him as He is face-to-face, everything will be renewed. We also have a solid hope that our present struggles will be worth it. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Present sufferings. At least one of our church family is suffering with the effects of kidney stones. Do I hear a corporate? Ugh. I just hear it's horrendous. Some of our people are dealing with fractured families and the pain of shared parenting. Some are dealing with chronic depression. And as difficult as these things are, these sufferings, the scriptures tell us that they don't begin to compare to the glory that will one day be revealed to us and in us as God completely transforms us from the inside out. Jesus came to be with us. He offers peace, hope, and joy so that we might be with him eternally. Merry Christmas. So what are the practical results of this biblical hope? Well, I would say, for one, enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. Uh, I mean, this might surprise some of you, but I'm more of a glasses half empty kind of guy than a glasses half full kind of guy. But when I'm here with you focused on the real meaning of Christmas, I can't help but be enthusiastic about it. God loves you, He has a purpose for your life, and He sent His Son Jesus to earth that we might be redeemed 
that we might be forgiven for sin, that we might receive the greatest gift of eternal life. Merry Christmas. I think we ought to be excited about that. That every day of this Christmas season should be a reminder of how much God loves us. I think that ought to flow from our lives into the lives of the people around us. And secondly, I think patience. Now, it's kind of ironic that I'm encouraging you towards patience because I'm one of the most impatient people I know. But when I realize that God is completely in control, then I ought to have the patience to let him work things out as he will. After all, I've read the end of the book. I know who wins. Do you know? It's the Lord Jesus Christ will reign for all eternity. So we ought to be patient as God's working out his timing. Let's remind each other of that. And then lastly, courage. Courage. This blessed assurance gives us courage to stand for God. Look, some of you will be at family gatherings in the next couple of weeks where you might be the only one or just a few who really follow Christ as Lord and really believe in the Christ of Christmas and demonstrate a life that's been transformed because of the hope, the unswerving hope that you have. I pray that God gives you courage to represent Him well in those moments. When the world is resistant, some of you work in places where you have to be very careful about saying Merry Christmas because they want Christ completely out of Christmas. Hey, the holidays isn't even a bad description because it really comes from words that mean holy days. And what makes it holy? Jesus coming. But I know we can say all of those phrases and completely push Jesus out of the picture. Hope in Christ gives us courage when the world is resistant, when we feel like we're standing alone, even in the face of death. I recently watched uh, the movie portraying the very emotional account of a a Christian singer-songwriter named Jeremy Camp and the love of his life, Melissa. Melissa was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And so as a singer-songwriter, they asked everyone at their concerts to pray along with them. Tens of thousands of people joined them, believing God would bring healing in Melissa's life. And when this 20-year-old lady went in for an emergency hysterectomy, the surgeon announced that they found no trace of cancer. She had been healed. And they praised God and were soon married. But they didn't live happily ever after. They were soon married and before their honeymoon was even over, Melissa started to experience severe abdominal pain and they came back uh, sooner than expected from their honeymoon and The oncologist said that the cancer was back with a vengeance and it filled her entire body. And here is this young couple experiencing new love. And what are they going to do? Just hope beyond all hope that it'll all turn out well? They continued to rest in the promises of God, live out the hope that God had demonstrated he was worthy of. In fact, Shortly after Melissa died and was promoted to heaven, Jeremy wrote a song, I Still Believe. That's the name of the movie that tells their story. I recommend it to you and your family. And they said, up to the very moment of her promotion, and then Jeremy on his own beyond that, we still believe, we still have hope, because the hope that we live by is in the rock-solid faithfulness of who God is. And he proved that when Jesus came to earth. Merry Christmas. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for these words of hope. And uh, while the world is starving for this kind of hope, thank you that you revealed it to us in a way that we could not miss. In the person of baby Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you didn't remain in the manger but that you grew up and that you went to the cross. Thank you. We praise you that you didn't remain in the grave, but that you rose again and offer forgiveness and hope in eternal life. Thank you that this is a hope that will not disappoint. And God, I pray for any soul that has not yet done business with you, has not surrendered and received this gift. Would you, this Christmas, 
Speak by your spirit into their hearts. Reveal Jesus as the Son of Man and Jesus as the eternal Son of God. That's how we worship you today. Let's stand and respond with this song. Merry Christmas, church family. Don't forget, you have opportunity to uh, love on Pastor Martin and Christy. They'll be in the commons along with the cupcakes. Remember that as a church family, we want to be 
engaging Jesus and others every day for eternal impact. Merry Christmas. Thank you.